Hello, my name is Nancy Jutton, and we have a very exciting conversation that's about to start on the Learn More, Earn More YouTube channel that I host. I am the leader of the Raise Your Voice, Make Your Impact Facebook community and the host of this amazing show. And I bring guests to the program that have value to add to the Learn More, Earn More conversation. And today's show is going to be particularly special because we're talking about something a little bit uncommon. You know, a lot of times we're talking about learning more and earning more, but one of the things that we've been shown, especially in the year 2020, is that life can turn on a dime. And what have we noticed is that with the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been hundreds of thousands of lives cut short by surprise. And that has left a lot of angst in families across the country and around the world that there is actually a way to try to ease some of that angst by having some powerful conversations before life hits the fan. As John Lennon has often been quoted as saying, life is what happens while you're making other plans. And if you are a business owner responsible for bringing home the bacon and frying it up in a pan and taking care of the parents and taking care of the kids and taking care of everything else, the last thing you can really look forward to is having to have your business derailed because life turned on a dime when nobody was prepared for it. So that's part of what it is that we're going to talk about today. And it's an important, powerful conversation that needs to happen in every family. And so let me introduce our amazing guest, Maureen Kiris, who is the CEO of Radiant Morning. With a career spanning 30 years in the medical industry, Maureen Curis is no stranger to end-of-life issues. As an oncology hospice and ICU nurse, she was privileged to provide end-of-life care for many individuals. As a nurse supporting bone marrow transplants, she had the opportunity to assist in extending life for many others. It's no surprise that this specialized work led to Maureen to develop a unique perspective on death. She saw firsthand the devastation that could occur when families hadn't had candid conversations with their family members, conversations that could have prevented and prepared everyone to more positively weather the transition of their loved one. So Maureen, what a pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Nancy. It's a pleasure to be here. So 30 years as an oncology nurse. Actually, 35. 35. That's a- I, mean, I was like, wait. <laughs> How those years pass so quickly? Such an important, such important work you did, and such important insights about what really happens in families. Um, what led you to decide in this finest hour of your life to create Radiant Morning to bring those conversations that often go unsaid alive in families today? You know, it was a chance um, post on Facebook that led me down this, this path. Uh, I met a wonderful woman who does similar work up in, in Canada, and she just made me realize the importance and that this changes people's end of life story by having these conversations well in advance. I've been an advocate for getting your healthcare power of attorney documents in place for 30 plus years because I've seen what happens when people don't have someone to advocate for them when they cannot make their own decisions. So I've been a passionate advocate uh, talking to everyone I know for 30 years to get that healthcare agent uh, decided and, and documented. So, um, so that's really what led me to this, this conversation led me to realizing that there's a lot of people out there that just don't know how to have these conversations and the benefit of the conversation. Brilliant. Now, in 2020, many of us have been grounded from taking airplane flights, but I've heard you speak before about this metaphor about taking a trip. And I thought that that would be a great story to tell to kick off this conversation, because I think it might open our eyes to why this matters. Oh, I'd love to tell it. I'll give the condensed version. You know, just imagine that you have planned your dream trip to Paris and you've spent two years planning, getting everything in order, you know, your best hotels, restaurant reservations across the city. You have your museum tours booked and planned, knowing exactly what pieces of art you want to see. And you imagine the aroma of the cafe au lait that you're sipping at a, at a roadside bistro. And 
the big day arrives. You go to the airport with your bags packed, so excited to get on the plane. And you settle in, watch a couple movies, and then you doze off and man, you're jetting direct flight from Seattle to Paris. And you're, you wake up to the flight attendant saying, please bring your seat backs and tray tables to their upright position. We are going to be landing in 20 minutes. And you're all excited, your heart's pounding and you sit there, you get everything uh, arranged and the pilot comes on. Okay, everyone, thanks for flying with us. We're gonna be landing in Poland in just a few minutes. And you think, what, Poland? No, this can't be. I'm not going to Poland, I'm going to Paris. How did this happen? And you call the flight attendant over. Yes, it's landing in Poland. You didn't hear it wrong. And it's just sends you into chaos and turmoil. Like you don't know, you didn't plan for this. You didn't prepare and how could this be? And this happens every day. It happens every day to people. And I think we're seeing it with COVID. You're planning the trip to Paris and you end up in Poland without any plans. It happens when you're on vacation and your spouse slips and falls and hits their head and is dead three days later from a cerebral hemorrhage. And it happens when your 20 something year old son is in an accident and becomes a quadriplegic. Or it happens when you're, mother who's healthy and active has a heart attack at age 62 and is declared brain dead two days later. And these are all true things that are happening every single day. I was the nurse that took care of those three different scenarios and not one of those families had planned. They had no, they had no planning. They didn't know what to do. They were thrown into drama, trauma and chaos trying to figure it out. And, and so, way. so what happens for families in that case? Not only are you suffering the profound loss of someone that you love very deeply, but what decisions are you struggling to make or not make because you didn't know what you needed to know to do the right thing by your loved one? Well, not knowing their wishes, you know, not contemplating what could the what ifs, the the medical emergency, the um, unexpected accident, you know, by by planning for these in advance. That gives us insight into what our loved one would want. And it's easier to honor their wishes then. So I think that it's just planning. We plan for everything in our lives. We plan for a baby being born. We plan for um, college graduation, high school graduation. We plan for our holiday parties. We plan for weddings, but we don't plan for the one inevitable in life. And that is death. I mean, that is the one inevitable. And by planning in advance and having these kind of candid conversations and the what if, where you are today, if this happened, what would you want? It's the conversations we're afraid to have and they make all the difference. You know, it's so funny you bring this up because I've been happily married to the love of my life for 33 years. And up until about three years ago, we'd never had a conversation like that. You know, you know everything there is to know about your spouse, what time they wake up in the morning, what their funny quirks are. You even know when they hold their jaw a certain way that they're irritated with you and they're not telling you the truth. There's so much intimacy between you and your partner. And because of uh, some rather challenging things that happened in our life, one day I said to him, you know, I never asked you, what would you want to do? what would you want me to do if you were in an accident and you couldn't have a normal life and their, your functions were severely compromised? Like, what would you like me to do about that? And he said, well, put me on an ice flow and push me out to sea. I'll fall asleep and that'll be enough. And then we had a little laugh about it. Right. And then I said, really, is that what you want? He says, listen, if I'm not able to stand up and take nourishment and speak up and do the things that I want to do, please, no extraordinary measures. And I said, okay. And then he said, how about you? I said, same. I said, okay, let's write that down. Because if the one that you love the most has never told you what they want, how can you possibly know? And in my own case, last December, I'm rushing my husband to the emergency room with stroke symptoms. And I'm going all, all through my head, I'm thinking, do I know what he wants? Can we get there fast enough? Not knowing what the outcome was going to be. Fortunately, 
he was able to make a full recovery, but I was had so much peace of mind en route to the hospital because not only did I know his medications, but I knew his wishes and I knew I had his medical information. I had all that stuff so that I wasn't like when you're in a crisis, that's sometimes your executive skills go out the window. <laughs> They do because uh, let's face it, when you're in a crisis, you're on emotion and adrenaline. Right. And it's hard to make and make rational decisions when you're in an emotional state. So that being said, if we are faced with making an urgent, urgent decisions for ourselves or other ones as soon as possible, what is your best advice given your experience with end of life planning? I think if you've never had this conversation, it's going to be difficult. If you've never had, you know, the, the conversations about what you want, it's going to be difficult. But my advice is to take some deep breaths and just calm yourself and try to think rationally. And it's very hard. I'll tell you, um, talking about healthcare agents, I become a healthcare agent unbeknownst to me, which that's another conversation. <laughs> Don't ever do that to anyone. Unbeknownst to me of a woman that I loved. She was like my adopted mom here in Seattle. The one medical procedure I hadn't gone to um, with her, hadn't accompanied her to, was the one where there was a big major crisis, health, medical emergency, her bowel ruptured during the middle of a uh, an exploratory procedure. It wasn't surgical um, to see what was going on. They knew something was going on. So I had never talked to her about any of this. I tried, but she, this was 10 years ago. She just didn't want to even address it. She wanted to see what was going on. And, and so there <clears throat> the doctor said, we don't think she's going to make it through the weekend. And I walked into her ICU room, every machine. I mean, she had 20 IVs, a ventilator, heart monitor, everything, all this beeping and machinery going off. So I had nothing to draw on except my experience being the nurse at a bedside like that. And so I'm thinking, okay, what would she want? What would she want? And don't go into nurse mode where you want to um, make decisions based on your experience. Let's think about what she would want. It was very, very difficult. It was very emotional, even for someone that has a lot of experience in this, this field. Um, so that was very hard. And I think to step back, take some deep breaths, just give yourself time. A medical emergency, you still have time. You don't have to make a split second decision right there most of the time. And even if you do, just to give yourself that 10, 20 seconds of taking deep breaths and thinking, okay, what's the rational thing to do here? What's the rational thing? And then if it is a medical emergency, to ask the doctors, what is the prognosis for this? What is their chance of survival? What is their chance of being back to where they were? I think in a medical crisis, if you can rationally talk to the physicians or the medical personnel and say, what's their chance of getting back um, to where they were before the accident? If it's a 5% chance that they'll know who and where they are after surviving this, do you want to go ahead and put them on a ventilator? Do you want to go ahead and do this? So start thinking of these things now. Okay. Now, um, what are some of the biggest mistakes that families make when faced with uh, a medical crisis? I think some of the biggest mistakes is that they, they let emotions take over which is our natural inclination. We were just talking about that with emotions. And I think um, in a medical crisis, well, I'll give you an example. Even if they've had some conversation about this, a good friend of my family's, uh, this woman that my family had grown up with, I, her daughter was my good friend in childhood. In the last, well, six months, she ended up, she had had a lot of health issues and she had flippantly said, I never want to be put on a breathing machine. Well, she was taken to the hospital and it was tough because it was during COVID 
and COVID era and her family could not really be with her. They, they were able to get into the ER with her because it was during the summer when things were a little laxer, but they said she won't survive without being put on life support. And her daughter convinced her father to put her on life support. She was so emotional. She just couldn't make that decision. And she couldn't bear to think of her mom dying. So they put her on life support. They put her on a ventilator and she lived that way for five days before her husband finally said enough. You know, he, he lived in his car at the hospital all day long. He was allowed to go in one hour a day to see her. And so instead of being surrounded by her family, surrounded by love, she was in a hospital alone with her husband there one hour a day. And he finally said, I, no, not anymore. She has to be taken off. It was very traumatic for the family. It was very um, sad. It was, it shouldn't have been that way, but emotions took over and emotions and not having those really candid conversations that you have on a regular basis, regular, I mean, annually, uh, just to make sure that they are still the same wishes as the person. So, so you know, my I, thing is talking about it. Yeah, it's so important to talk about it. And I think if there are siblings involved, it's especially important because I have heard stories where mom or dad is in the dire situation and one sibling says, mom never would have wanted to, to be cared for this way. And the other sibling is says, but we have to go to extraordinary measures because mom's my best friend and I can't live without her. And if the inevitable is that mom is going to pass, that consequence can be that these two siblings will be so distraught and upset with each other that their relationship post-mortem will be forever fractured. And that can be another casualty for not having those conversations. Yeah. That's a big casualty. So when I was telling the story about Paris and the 62 year old healthy woman that ended up brain dead, she came into the ICU and I happened to be the nurse that admitted her. So that meant I was her primary nurse throughout her stay. She had four children, no husband. Her 85 year old mother had performed CPR on her as she, this was back in the mid nineties. She had pulled her from the car before everyone had cell phones. Her mother did CPR as she had seen it on TV. She ended up in the ICU on a ventilator. She was 62. She had played tennis that morning, you know, um, taking her mother to a doctor's appointment and she had four children. Well, they had never talked about anything like this. They had never anticipated this. And when the doctors gave the diagnosis that she had no brain activity, she was brain dead. Two of her children wanted to take her off life support and two of them accused the siblings of trying to kill their mother. And that's when the fighting began and the fighting continued and because she had no healthcare agent, no power of attorney document signed. They were all her next of kin and they all had to agree. So if there's, if there's siblings as the next of kin or multiple people as the next of kin, everyone has to be in agreement or the person must be kept on life support. So she oh. lived for six and a half weeks. Oh my goodness. With the family and these, these kids just fighting. It was like a war zone in the room. It was so depressing, so sad. Her mother would sit in the corner crying, saying, what have I done to this family? And almost 30 years later, I believe they are still or as fractured as they were. It was, it was awful. And her body finally just gave out and they couldn't resuscitate her. And it was such a blessing at that point, but the family was forever fractured. Well, none of us want that to happen. And so I want to ask you, you do work with families that want to be proactive in anticipating these conversations and coming to agreement. Tell us a little bit about these facilitated conversations that you have with families to bring out the important issues and to get them on paper. Well, first I start working with usually one of the individuals, either one of the parents or maybe that woman that is trying to hold the family together knows her parents are aging and needs to have this conversation but doesn't know how to start it with her siblings. And, and so we work through what they would want themselves, the person that is, is um, the driver of this meeting and getting their wishes documented, decided and documented. And then we draw the family together. 
And we start the conversation based on the wishes of the, the person. And that opens it up to other family members expressing their wishes. The main goal is for whoever is um, instigating the meeting to get their wishes known so that, that the family can honor those wishes. You don't have to agree with them. And it's very vibrant conversation. Sometimes it's a little, uh, there could be confrontation. There's emotions. There's a lot of emotions around this topic, but it's so healing and wonderful to come to realize at, at the end of these meetings that, wow, we can honor our parents' wishes or we can honor our spouse's wishes or we can honor our children's wishes because the children even get involved. If there's adult children, uh, there was a family with some 20 somethings and they, they said, hey, wait, we need to make these decisions too because of the conversation that was going on with the family. And so let it, me ask you a question. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's great. We're in the time of COVID and people are doing business virtually these days. <clears throat> so are you able to use the power of Zoom video to facilitate conversations with families where there are members that may be states or countries away? You know, that is the great thing about COVID that it has taught me. I really, I'm an in-person person. I like that to be there and nurture but and guide. But with Zoom, my 88-year-old father-in-law now has mastered Zoom. So it made me really realize this is a beautiful thing because you can draw the family together. It's not quite the same as being in person, but everyone can hear the wishes straight from the person. When and, I can't start, you, and can't you also record those and calls? And you can record it and you can give that to the family so that if there's ever any question, they can say, but this is what mom said she wanted. We have it in writing and here we have her voice on tape, on this video. So if they're trying, having a difficult time making decisions or if there's some conflict within the family, it's a great tool to go back to. So when we have, let's just say a family wants to have one of these group facilitated meetings and that you're going to lead it. How many meetings are involved and what is special and different about the tone that you set in these meetings that people can actually if it's possible, look forward to actually having the conversation. Uh, well, usually there's two, two sessions beforehand to prep for the meeting to make sure that uh, the person facilitate, or instigating this meeting uh, has all of their wishes documented so that when we go to the meeting, everyone can have a copy so it's important for them to really know what they want and, and what they want to share with their family. Usually I try to tell them that we don't have to get everything covered in one family meeting, but to have three main goals that you want to achieve with your, with your family meeting, three main points that you want to get across. And then... Um, and those could be, for example, the three those, main points could the be... The three main points would, they want to die at home. Do you know 80% of Americans surveyed have said they want to die at home, yet only 20% do. The majority of people actually die in a hospital or an assisted living type facility. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits and beauties of COVID might be that people do come around to dying more at home. So where do they want to die? What do they want? Would they want life support? At, at my age, I'm in my late 50s, I would want life support if something happened, uh, if something happened like a medical crisis and there was hope that I could, could live and get back to where I was. Now, if I had a life-limiting illness, that would be another story. So from where they're at at that day to talk about what they would want and then scenarios and the other, so that, and so, no, the, at home, the, their their wishes and then yeah so does this ever get um do people start to wonder well who's going to get grandma's dining room table and who's going to get the condo in in the hamptons did people start 
you know, wading into those kinds of issues when yes, they, they do. Up. And that's something that that we do talk about at at family meetings because that's what fractures families. I have met a number of people that have either no longer speak to their their siblings, their family members because of some inheritance. Um, I had uh, met a man recently who is being sued by his siblings because he's the executor of his parents' estate and they think he's stealing from the estate despite documentation from attorney, tax accountants and everything, financial advisors showing that he is not. And that's when heightened emotions come. So yes, yeah, saying, I don't want you to fight over the lamp in the corner. So let's figure out how to talk about all these. That is another topic of the conversation. Yes, in the family meetings. You know, my mom passed away this year and she was a needlepoint artist. And she spent hours and hours creating these county fair award-winning um, needlepoint art. And I remember I have a sister and we were gathering for some reason. And she says, which of these needlepoint masterpieces do you want? Which of these needlepoint do you want? I want to make sure I put your name on it so that we don't mess it up just in case. You know, <laughs> Of course, that's needle, so good. You know, the needlepoint was so much more important to her than it was to either one of us. <laughs> but I'm happy to tell you that that I've got the needlepoint art that that I selected. <laughs> you know, uh, that's so funny. Can I tell you a quick story about my family? My great grandfather was a shipbuilder in Los Angeles. And he also furnished all of his children's homes with this beautiful handmade furniture that's very I mean, it's it's very old, but my mom has this beautiful secretary desk that he made. It's all carved and inlaid and secret compartments. Well, my two brothers both want it. Oh. And my mother, and I'm the executor of the estate, and my mother will not make a decision. <laughs> I said, mom, here's the deal. Why don't you sit down and talk with each of them, have the two of them together and talk about why they want that. It might work itself out. And if it doesn't, you could put their name in hat or in a bag and shake it up in front of them draw a name and then they'll know well she told me I've decided who's going to get it and I said great have you talked to them no you can deal with that after I'm gone I said that's not fair to me oh that's not fair to me you know so um there's so that brings me to another question that I want to I'd love to get your point of view on you know sometimes when there are multiple siblings the parents get together who are thinking ahead and creating their wills and saying, I'm going to designate both of my kids to be the executor of the estate. Just curious, Maureen, given all the interesting conversations you've had with families on both sides of this conflict, what would you say to a family that was just deciding that two people need to carry that weight? Well, you know, I don't, I'm not the legal expert. But I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's always, so I'll take it from the power of attorney, uh, the healthcare agent. It's, in my opinion, never a good idea to have two healthcare agents because you could disagree. I couldn't agree more. And I'll tell you something. My parents did that to my sister and I, that we would both have joint responsibility to making the decisions. And fortunately, we did a nice job of it. But practically speaking, when there's tomes and tomes of papers that have to be signed, the remote signing episodes of the reverse mortgage with this many pages that I have to sign in Washington and the similar number of pages that she needs to sign in California that need to be signed and dated on the same day. It's, it's just a coordination. It's an element of coordination and chaos that, that is not ideal. So have a conversation from, from the trenches of real life, I would say, have a conversation with both kids and say, listen, the oldest born is gonna have this role and the, the second, the next kid is gonna have second share. And well, it's, it's not because we love either one of you any less, it's because we want you to have less conflict and be able to get through the paperwork sooner versus later and get on with the rest of your lives joyfully. That's what I would say. And you know, that. there's a role for everyone. Uh, there's four siblings in my family. There's a role that each of us can take. One being the executor, one being the power of attorney for healthcare, power of attorney for finance. Um, and the one that maybe 
is the communicator, the one that lets everyone know what's happening. So there's roles that you can give to each one. And, and it's easy for parents to say, this is why we're choosing you. And one of my friends, her, she was very put off that her mother chose her sister to be her healthcare agent over her because she thought she was better choice. And I said, you're emotional. And your mom needs you to be there loving on her and, and showering all your emotion on her and your sister's more practical. And so she can make those practical decisions easier than you. So your mom recognized that and gave you each the job that she needed you to do. She needed you to be there to love on her. And, and that's just what happened. She was able to, to just fully be present with her mom without having to worry about making these challenging decisions. So I have a comment or a question. You know, procrastination is something that we all face in our lives. Oh, I'm going to get to that later. I'm going to get to that later. That's definitely on my to-do list, but sometimes we never get around to it. And that's when we get ourselves into a world of trouble and aggravation. Mm -hmm. So one of the advantages that I'm kind of imagining when someone says, Maureen, I want to set up a facilitated family meeting so that our end of life wishes are discussed, documented, and what was the third D? Decided. Decided, decided documented, and discussed. That means you're putting that dream on a deadline and that it's going to actually happen versus getting around to it, getting around to it, and having that checkbox on the list never checked. So for those who have an urgent requirement to get this conversation started, it seems to me that their first call should be to you so that you can be their guide to make sure it gets done. What do you think? Oh, I think so. You know, my dream is that everyone would have their end of life documentation done and the discussions with the family. It's great to have the documentation done, but if you don't have that important family discussion so that they can know your wishes and honor your wishes, um, the documentation is good, but really what's the, what's the point? So it's, yeah, getting that conversation going. So if folks want, if, if just listening to this conversation today, they're saying, oh my gosh, this is exactly the message I needed to receive today. I want to get in touch with Maureen to schedule a family meeting. What is the best way for them to get in touch with you to do that right away? They can go to uh, startthetopnow.com and there is a free download for a prompt conversation guide. And they can also schedule a chat on that website with me they can um, schedule a complimentary 30 minute call. And I want to suggest that everyone do that right away. I would say run, don't walk to talk, start, start. talk now.com to download this start the talk now conversation packet, which has ways that you can start the conversation right now before Santa comes down the chimney and the new year dawns. And then there's one other thing I wanted to ask you about, which is, you certainly do the individual family meetings that you can hold virtually all across the country, but don't you also offer some kind of a course that people can enjoy online so that they can have the whole family participate, but perhaps at a, um, in, at, with a different level of engagement? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I offer a five-week course that goes, you know, my next one starts um, after the beginning of the year. And I'm offering those multiple times a year. It's five weeks, we go over everything. The goal is to get your decisions made, your decisions documented on your advanced directives and get that power of attorney document completed. And then they walk away with a template on how to discuss this with their families. So- And, and could it also be that this five week exercise is is like this it could be a comp this five-week exercise could be just what people need to do to start and finish the job but it could be that people run into potholes and missing pieces when they're doing the five-week exercise and that's when they come to this realization that a group facilitated family meeting led by you is going to be the fastest path to resolution is that right yes yes 
that's, you know, my, my main goal through all of this is to get the families talking. That's just, once those family conversations take place, it changes the ball game. It changes people's end of life outcomes. They can die at home if they want because they've planned. So yes, they can um, end up working with me as facilitator of family meetings after the five week course. Well, and I'm just, I'm sort of curious. I know that I can download the special report, but you know, it is a somber topic. Some people don't want to talk about it. Is there a light way to start a conversation about this or, or turn a phrase or a particular favorite question that people can take away from this conversation today that they might want to toss out over the backyard fence this holiday season? Well, you know, I always think you have to keep the humor in it, but I think that if we just realize what's going on with COVID, COVID is the perfect conversation starter, and it's a heavier topic, but to just say, gosh, mom, gosh, dad, with all that's happening with COVID, I want to have this conversation. This is important to me that I know your wishes and can honor them if anything were to happen, because gosh, we just don't know what's gonna happen as it's been proven. We have 300,000 Americans that started the year thinking they had the year ahead of them and they're not here now. So um, just just use COVID as the, the starting point and keep humor in it. You can add whatever humor you want, but it is a somber subject, but it doesn't have to be just doom and gloom. Well, and after is the best medicine for this. Well, and, and this is kind of a fun story that might put a little red bow on this whole matter. You know, there's what would you like when you're in the hospital, how you want to go. And then it can even get as granular as what you're going to wear at the open casket scenario where people are walking by to pay their final respects. And so to put a little humor on this, the best man in our wedding sadly passed when he was in his early 50s and I'd never been to a funeral before and he was like a Brooks Brothers dress for success kind of guy and that's one of my memories of him and so there was an open casket I was really afraid of doing this but my husband says come on let's just go say goodbye and we we approached the casket and looked inside and he was wearing this god-awful 1960s psychedelic tie and I just went I couldn't believe it and so I whispered into my husband's ear he wouldn't have been caught dead wearing a tie like that <laughs> <laughs> and and we both laughed and we um we, we got up and left and I thought to myself you know you can even get to the level of what you want to be wearing when you're when you're done because I know <laughs> Maybe he planned that so everyone would have a laugh, but uh, <laughs> you know, if you if you don't plan that, my gosh, you get put in the polyester suit with the psychedelic tie, the Brooks Brothers man. You know, I have a friend whose grandmother was late everywhere, everywhere she went. She was always late, notoriously late. And she used to always say, I'm going to be late for my own funeral. Well, sure enough, the hearse on the way to the funeral had a blowout tire and they were half an hour late getting the body to the funeral. So everyone was laughing, thinking just like she always said, she was always late. And here she is late to her own funeral. Which kind of like, be careful, be careful what you wish for. Right? I know. <laughs> well, Maureen Kerr, is what a pleasure to talk with you about this very important and practical and profound conversation that needs to start right now. So for those of you who are watching live or by replay, please go to startthetalknow.com, run, don't walk, and start the talk now. And if you feel called to have Maureen be the facilitator of a family meeting that will give everyone in your family peace of mind, please reach out to her through the website at Start the Talk Now so that that conversation can start right now. Maureen, what a pleasure to be with you today. You're doing such a, your work is such a blessing to families everywhere. And I hope that your mission of touching and transforming, how many lives is it? A million. A million lives. Why not go big? Whose lives are, whose wishes are discussed, decided, and documented. I say today's the day and thank you so much for this powerful conversation. Thanks for having me, Nancy. My pleasure.